from the University of Arizona. We have Mark Meyer presenting robotic first rib resection. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lazaro and uh, Dr. Gilbert. I'd like to thank the Society for allowing me to present uh, robotic first rib resection for TOS, uh, redefining the diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> No financial disclosures. Uh, let me see. Let me use this. So, uh, as we all know, thoracic outlet syndrome is uh, highly under underdiagnosed. Um, it can occur up in 0.3 to 8 percent of the population. Thanks. We feel that the the current uh, understanding of uh, of thoracic outlet syndrome may be inaccurate. There is a there is a overlap of the symptoms with the vascular and nerve. The most recent understanding of thoracic outlet syndrome, in our opinion, is that the venous compression in Paget-Schroeder syndrome is caused by a uh, congenitally malformed first rib uh, with a tubercle compressing the subclavian vein. Um, we all, also, in our opinion, uh, in the majority of patients with neurologic symptoms, <clears throat> that suffer, uh, these patients tend to suffer from compression of the subclavian artery by a malformation of the first rib with resulting neural ischemia. We published uh, results in 2012 showing a, 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 a bony tubercle at the medial portion of the first rib. Here's a, a picture of the a bony tubercle. This new understanding explains why many diagnostic tests could potentially be inconclusive. Uh, the gold standard is angiography and venography. Uh, in our institution, we recently supplanted this by an MRA, MRV of the thoracic outlet with abduction of the upper extremity. Uh, we also are now using a CT with 3D recon uh, of the first rib. Here's a picture of an MRV uh, with a patient's arm in hyperabduction uh, showing compression of the subclavian vein. Here's a, a CT 3D recon images showing uh, abnormality of the first rib at the medial portion. Uh, the most common approaches uh, are transaxillary and supracavicular. Uh, thoracotomy is associated with high morbidity, and thoracoscopy can be uh, very technically challenging. This is a picture of a supraclavicular approach, a keyhole incision. Uh, it, this can also be technically challenging and treacherous. Uh, we feel that the most direct approach uh, to the first rib is from within the chest, as shown right here, first rib. Uh, we published our initial results in innovations in 2012. For the operation, the patient is placed in the lateral decubitus position. The robot comes from the head of the patient. We use three incisions. And here I'll just show you a quick video. We're, so we're inside the right, uh, right hemithorax. We're dissecting the parietal pleura off of the first rib. The subclavian vein is right there. And we essentially are di dissecting the borders of the first rib. Now, the robot has been removed in this picture. And this is via a VATS approach, where we actually divide the first rib with a kerosene rib uh, cutter. And that's shown here. We divide it at its thinnest portion. And so we take uh, approximately about half of the rib out, as opposed to some people who take out the entire rib. Or so once the rib is divided, we then, we then, you'll see it shortly. We'll redock. The, you see the, the the medial portion of the rib being a little bit more mobile. So now we redock the robot, and we have two hook cauteries. One hook cautery is, uh, is actually going to disarticulate the rib at its joint, and then you can see another hook cautery is retracting the rib. So we're dissecting the uh, tissue off of the rib. Now we don't do uh, we don't do any scaling lysis. This is just we're just dissecting, removing this, the the muscles off of the uh, first rib. So we continue our dissection to free up the rib. And once we free it up completely, we then place it in an endo bag. So we retrospectively reviewed uh, our. Our patients presenting with symptoms of thoracic outlet syndrome who underwent robotic first rib resection. These patients underwent an MRA, MRV, or angiography, and CT of the first rib to diagnose if there was extrinsic arterial or venous compression. Patients were classified based on imaging as having arterial or venous compression. 
Basic demographics, perioperative data, along with follow-up symptomatic questionnaires and imaging studies were reviewed. Uh, we had 48 operations over a, a five-year time period. Uh, these were mostly young patients. Uh, the gender was relatively uh, similar in proportion. Uh, mean operative time was uh, over two hours. Uh, median hospitalization was three days. Uh, there were no uh, surgical complications and there was no mortalities. Uh, 21 out of the 48 patients that presented with neurologic symptoms, pain, paresthesias, um, in our most recent uh, patients, we did MRAs of these patients, and in eight of them showed compression of their subclavian artery. Uh, 13 patients, these were the older patients uh, that had an angiogram, showed comp uh, arterial angiogram, showed compression of the subclavian artery. Uh, all these patients underwent robotic first rib resection. Uh, median follow-up was, was uh, four months. Uh, these patients were followed up immediately post-op, uh, two months, four months with MRA or angiography. Um, the, all patients had experienced symptomatic relief based on a, a symptom questionnaire. Um, and then the, the subclavian artery was patent um, in all patients based on the objective uh, finding on the MRA. Uh, 27 out of 48 patients presented with Paget-Schroeder disease, uh, our most recent cohort for this for this population, eight patients had an MRV showing subclavian venous compression, and 19 patients where we were traditionally did the venogram studies and the, the dynamic venograms uh, that showed subclavian vein compression on hyperabduction. Uh, all these patients had robotic uh, rib first rib resection on uh, venograms at three and six months. This is a combination of MR and, and uh, um, uh, IR venograms. Uh, all patients had a patent vein following robotic first rib resection and radiolog radiologic intervention in those who had a venous abnormality. Um, so if they if they had like you know persistent stenosis, then we would be more opt to do a um, a, uh, a, a a venogram that could do a, a venoplasty to the vein. Um, in conclusion. Uh, we, f we feel that neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome uh, is mainly caused by compression of the subclavian artery uh, by a congenital abnormality of the first rib. Uh, robotic transthoracic first rib resection is feasible and safe, and using this technique, uh, the offending portion of the first rib can be removed without uh, neurologic or vascular complications. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Meyer. Um, enjoyed your talk. Uh, I have a question about your workup for these patients, especially in the neurological thoracic uh, outlet syndrome, uh, whether you get nerve conduction uh, studies, and when you do your uh, CT reconstructions or MRAs, if you don't find that offending tubercle, do you still proceed with the operation? I'm intrigued, really, about your group uh, describing this tubercle, and it doesn't seem to have been reported in uh, in any of the other literature. Uh, we reported it. We reported in the in the pathology uh, literature, journal pathology. Uh, that was back in 2012. In terms of the EMGs, so our our current algorithm is patients that get referred to us with pain, paresthesias that's been going on for a while. We do get EMGs on those patients. We get an MRI of their C spine. Uh, we also get um, uh, the, the MRAs uh, as well. And so the MRI will, ru will rule out any spinal disease. Uh, the EMGs are very difficult to interpret because, you know, as, you, as you all know, it's conflicting results. Some of them that show abnormalities, that nothing's going on. Some of them don't show anything abnormal and there's something going on. So uh, we don't really rely on the, the, the main thing with the EMGs is if they have like a cervical rib uh, or bands in the neck, then we'll see a cutoff from the neck to the shoulder. So I think it's more reliable in, in ruling out for us, like if, if the EMG was positive, it showed an abnormality from the neck to the shoulder, then, then we won't do first rib resections on those patients. We'll be more inclined to do neurolysis. Um, in terms of, uh, in our preliminary work, so far what we found is that uh, the patients, all the patients have some abnormality of that first rib. Um, so, so you rely on the clinical diagnosis more than the objective uh, studies? We, we take a combination of everything. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, um, 
disease. I mean, it has its poor understanding. There's a lot of uh, you know a lot of these patients. They come back and they. Uh, I mean, historically, um, they they don't have complete symptom resolution. So, you know, it's, and this could further be researched with the neural ischemia is possibly using transcutaneous oximetry to see if that actually okay. If this is neural ischemia, then is it actually getting decreased blood flow in the arm that's resulting? In, so that would be a future, future part of our study. Mark, I have one question for you. I have not done these robotically, and I usually do them from a, a, a cervical approach. But I've always been impressed that for the Paget-Schroeder uh, syndrome, it's not just a matter, in my experience, of removing the rib, but there's usually a fair amount of fibrosis and tissue around the vein that needs to be sort of dissected free and released in order to have adequate uh, caliber. Do you find that uh, to be a, some issue robotically that you've identified? Can you do that type of release of the tissue around the structures? So it's very difficult to, with the, with the transthoracic approach, to do any type of uh, venolysis because um, it, it, you're going to get into treacherous area and then you know, if you get into bleeding, which, uh, you know, we can re repair thoracoscopically. But we think that the, the main reason is the bone that compresses the vein. A lot of times it, it can get uh, stenotic or uh, from, the, from any inflammation around it. But in, the, in a few of those patients, we get venograms afterwards, and they can always uh, balloon venoplasty, the vein, to help. And because it doesn't have that external compression by the rib, it's more apt to open up, okay. in, our, in our opinion. Thanks, sir. My name is Ingu Bak from Seoul, Korea. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, do you usually selectively cut the middle skull and muscle? No, we don't do, we don't, we don't, so we divide the scalene muscles off of the first rib. Mm. Uh, it's very intimate with it. Now, you're right, historically they, they talk about scalene lysis and scalenotomies, but um, we don't resect the scalene muscle and we don't. Uh, yeah, because uh, usually the recurrence occurs within two years. So I think uh, is it too early to conclude that it is safe for recurrence without division of middle square muscle? Yeah, I mean, historically they talk about costoclavicular ligaments, uh, scaling hypertrophy. Um, it, you would just feel that the bone, which is a solid structure, would be more apt to uh, okay. compress uh, a, a vascular uh, structure. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. We're going to have to move on.